Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. Today, we're going to look at how the economy may be inflecting towards the downside. And we're going to dig in to some unemployment numbers. We're going to look at the oil market. We're going to travel all the way to Japan. And we're going to get the dictionary out. And we're going to look up some definitions. All of this is, of course, to help you understand how the economy is working, malfunctioning, how it might be affecting your finances, your politics, our society. My name is Emil Kalinowski. This is Making Sense. I'm joined by Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Investments. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Good morning, Emil. It's hard to believe here we are in September. And September is always a, a very interesting month, isn't it? The One of the top trending questions and topics in our YouTube comments section and our Twitter feeds is the famed bottleneck. Is it going to happen? If it, How will we know it's going to happen? And I think you're, I don't hear about it anywhere else. So I think you should take credit for that. You've been writing about it for years. I remember this appearing in your 2014, 2015 articles, and we're going to raise it again for the first time in many, many months, at least since April, I believe you haven't written about it. So it's coming up. But first, we're going to look at the unemployment rate. And we're going to do it via your article that you posted at the Alhambra Investments uh, blog roll. And it is called, you posted on September 4th, so a week ago. Here's the, the, here's the title. Unfortunately, like old times, back to being the star of the payroll show. What are the general themes of this article, Jeff? Well, obviously, the payroll show is the BLS's main uh, monthly payroll reports where we get we get the establishment survey supposedly telling you how many jobs the economy added. And of course, the, the you know, the star of the show, especially last year and the year before, had been the unemployment rate because it tumbled to 50 year low. And many people took that as a sign that not only was the economy in good shape, it was in really, really, really good shape. And of course, you know, the unemployment rate took a back seat for the events in March and subsequent months after that. But over the last couple of months, the unemployment rate, which never did really get as high as people had feared for various reasons, now has tumbled back under 10% again and took a big tumble in the month of August. So everybody was talking about the unemployment rate as, some, as again, hopefully the, uh, in their minds, hopefully the, the, the real accurate picture of what the economy is actually doing at this time. Now, people might get confused because the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports several different unemployment measures, and there are two surveys they conduct. There's the Current Employment Statistics Survey, also known as the Payroll Survey, also known as the Establishment Survey. So there are three names for it. That's part of the confusion. And then there's the Current Population Survey, also known as the Household Survey. Geez, um, let's start with the establishment survey. Tell us a little bit about the inflection in this survey that we're seeing from reopening boom to kind of, mm. Well, first, I mean, look, the, what the BLS is doing is trying to get a measure of the employment market from both sides. The establishment survey, the CES, it, it, it's exactly what the name says. They survey establishments. They survey employers and say, how many workers do you have on your payrolls? So that's why we call it the payroll report. On the other side, the household survey, they're surveying people and people in households and saying, how many people in your household are working? So we're trying to get the, uh, the uh, a sense of the labor market from both employers and from workers and try to match up the two. And what people may not know is, while everybody pays attention to the establishment survey, because it's a bigger survey, it's, it has more uh, it has a much bigger population, a much bigger survey panel within it, and it's more heavily statistically, you know, um, you know, there's a lot more that goes into the calculation. It's smoothed out and all these other things. It's made to be the star of the show. The unemployment rate is actually drawn from the household survey. And the household survey in the month of August showed a massive gain in, in the number of households reporting the number of workers in each household. I think it was three, some, three point something million, uh, which was far and away better than expected. And because about a million people joined the labor force, the, the impact on the unemployment rate was a 1.8 per, 1, 1 point drop well down into the below 9% now. I mean, so it, it really looks like things are improving very quickly, despite what you know, the, the establishment survey kind of disappointed, but the household survey really pushed the unemployment rate down. 
Right, exactly. So that was the point I was trying to get to is that the household survey inflected in the positive direction, while the established one, establishment is sort of inflecting over, like it's losing momentum. So we need a, a tiebreaker, and you provided one in your article from the ADP report. So that's automatic data processing for our foreign viewers. This is a American human resources software company, and perhaps the product they're best known for, they've been around for 70 years, is to do payroll reports. And Jeff, for me, this sounds like the real stuff, right? You're actually getting data from the real economy, from real payrolls. And so what is the ADP report? Which one is it corroborating? Which inflection? Well, ADP will tell you that they cover about 80% of the economy. So they, ha and it's not just, it's, it's the private economy. It's the private sector, which is what we really want. We don't, you know, the, the, some of the uh, BLS payroll reports include government workers. Um, for example, in the establishment survey in August, there was a huge number of census, you know, temporary census workers that, that temporarily boosted the establishment survey. But, we'll, you know, we're, we're really looking at what's going on in the real economy, in the private economy. So ADP's numbers has about 80, you know, covers about 80% of the private economy. And the establishment survey also has a separate measure for just the number of private workers. Now, that number was even lower, obviously. I think it was just, just around a million, well as the ADP number was basically the same as the establishment survey's private number. And what both of those have shown is since the month of June, so starting in July, the level of rebound, the level of, I don't want to, I don't even think we call it growth at this point, but the, 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 uh, the rebound, the momentum, whatever you want to call it, seems to have taken a different tone since, uh, since June. So starting in July, it looks like the rate of rehiring slowed down materially. Now we have both of these surveys saying in the private economy that that seems to be the case. Something happened in July that may have impacted the, the rate of rebound and reopening or whatever that lingered into August. And audience, that's going to be a big theme. So pay attention. Something did happen in July. We're going to keep raising that point over and over. And Jeff, I'm just going to jump out of this article to an article that you wrote called Even More, suggesting something did happen in July. If anyone wants to read it, it was posted on September 9th at Alhambra Investments. And in that one, you bring in yet another measure of employment. This one, again, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's the job openings and labor turnover survey, which are they confirming what the ADP and the, establish, and the uh, establishment survey are saying? The JOLT survey, which is you know, the common name for it, what they're really trying to do is get into the, the details behind the major payroll reports and look at, as the name says, look at the turnover rates. Look at, you know, what is job openings really telling us about labor demand, for example? What are, what, how many, how many uh, postings online are companies putting up in the internet to, to see, you know, to advertise for, you know, uh, uh, positions and unfilled jobs and all sorts of things like that. So the JOLT survey is, is linked in some respects to the current employment situation surveys, but it's also separate in that it looks at a different parts of the, of, of the labor market from a different angle. And one of those angles is the, the rate of hiring. You know, there's always turnover in the labor market. In the best labor markets and in the worst labor markets, there's always people who are, who are quitting their jobs and saying, you know, screw it, I'm going someplace else. There's always companies that are saying, you know, we got to lay people off or we got to let people go. There's always turnover in the labor market. And so what can we judge from that turnover that might tell us something about especially momentum in the actual labor market as it is. And what the JOLT survey showed for July, because it's, it's one month further in the rears than the other surveys, what it showed for July in the uh, hires category was that the rate of hires, which had been you know, extremely good in, in May and June as the economy was reopening, obviously you would expect that companies were rehiring millions upon millions of workers. But then all of a sudden in July, the level of hiring activity uh, cooled off considerably. In fact, the level was bound down to where it, uh, in July to where it was less than it had been in the previous July, which wasn't exactly a great month for the labor market. So you have to ask yourself, you know, why would companies scale back in hiring when we have still such an enormous uh, jobs deficit left over from what happened earlier in the year? And that's that, you know, put that together with the ADP survey, the, the establishment survey's private number, you start to think, okay, something may really have happened in July 
that really did cool off the labor market to such an extent that it's showing up in multiple places. Okay, so we've got a few economic data points that are saying we don't quite believe the enthusiasm of this great rate of change in the unemployment rate. But now I'm going to go back to the other side and I'm going to pull up a graph from your article that we're discussing. It's going to show three lines that are descending and it's unemployment insurance claims. So let's talk about that graph, which seems to suggest that things are improving. I'm going to pull it up now and you tell the audience what those three lines are. And then more importantly, what is not included in those three lines. Yeah, we're really getting back into the major problems with the unemployment rate that we've been discussing for more than a decade, the participation problem, all the, all the things that are all the workers, really, former workers, that don't go into the unemployment rate. So, you know, if the unemployment rate is a comprehensive view of the economy, then okay, it's probably an accurate measure. But if it leaves out too many people, then it's only giving you a, a piece of the, it's only giving you, um, you know, a picture of what's going on in one small slice or even a large slice, but not enough of a slice of the real economy. So what we've put together here is the BLS, is, BLS has a, a specific number, a specific measure of the number of unemployed workers that fall within their bureaucratic definitions of what counts as unemployment. And as you can see, I mean, for this year at least, the level of unemployed, those, those the BLS has designated as unemployed in, in the United States, basically conforms to what we see in other kinds of things, like you know unemployment claims, which is it's data that's tracked by a different part of the government, still the Department of Labor, but yet it's the number of claims paid out by each state's uh, unemployment insurance programs. And, and you know there's consistency there, both seasonally adjusted and unadjusted. So it looks like, okay, the level of the number of unemployed, which is drawn from the household survey, the numerator in the unemployment rate seems to be pretty solid. And therefore, we have, you know, maybe some, some consistency in what the rate is essentially telling us. And now, what we're going to look at an, at the next graph, and that graph is showing something that is going to upset that entire apple cart. And so tell Jeff, Jeff, tell the audience, what you've added here. Well, ever since uh, the CARES Act was passed back in late March, uh, we now have a completely separate category of unemployment claims. And these, by the way, these pandemic unemployment assistance and pandemic emergency unemployment claims uh, programs are, f are run by the federal government. They're not paid by the state. You know, in other words, not, not only that, you have to be ineligible for regular state claims in order to go on the federal claims. So these are not double counted. These are on top of the regular unemployment, un unemployment claims. Um, some of it's based on, you know, our gig workers who may not qualify for a regular state job and therefore call, be eligible for a state claim. Some of it is um, self-employed workers, uh, self-employed people who have lost hours or lost business and therefore have no other place to turn to. So there's any number of reasons for why you're not on a regular state claim, but you have gone on a federal claim. And what we see since, um, obviously, since the CARES Act was passed is that millions upon millions of Americans have, have filed for eligibility, have been accepted into these programs, and are being paid by the federal government as opposed to the state government on top of the regular state claims which have gone into the unemployment rate. So what we're seeing in the blue line and in the uh, dotted blue line below it, and even to some extent the orange line, is some degree of labor market dysfunction that doesn't show up in the regular channels. It's, it's, it's self-employed workers, gig economy, whatever it, whatever it is, these are workers who are filing at the federal level and saying, look, and I'm, I've been harmed by this economy since March but they're obviously not falling into the major category or the major definitions and statistics. So the regular categories trending downward, maybe, maybe they're at a too high a level. Of course they are, but at least they're all going down. So maybe in a year we might be back to normal. You add in this unusual special category. If you add them together, and now I'm going to pull up the graph, what we see is that since about this summer, We've leveled off. We've hit a plateau. And the, what I don't see in here is a reopening boom. At least in these statistics, people with income hardship never experienced a reopening boom. 
you know, it's you know, it's almost weird because it almost it almost looks like people are rolling off of the state programs, exhausting their eligibility or whatever, and onto the federal programs. I don't think that's exactly what's happening, but that's exactly how it looks. It looks like for every worker that goes off of a state program, there is another worker that goes on to the federal program, which is not progress. Even if they're different workers, it's still, you know, a high degree of harm in the labor economy, a high degree of, of dysfunction in the overall economy, where that the total number of all claims since around, you know, early May when reopening happened has been relatively constant, which is not what you would expect given what you just said, Emil, which was, you know, hey, there's this reopening frenzy, this reopening boom. And we have a lot of statistics that say that. But when we look at, if we're just, if we're just really interested in you know, this potential hidden labor market harm or dysfunction, however you want to call it, it looks like there hasn't been as much progress as we would expect. It looks like there's been no progress. We've been stuck since early May at around 30 million people reporting income hardship of some sort. Jeff, just to wrap up this, this, uh, this article, we've talked about it before in previous episodes, but for any new members of our audience, can you talk about how you ended this article where you talk about that there are two different labor pools and how they're melding together and it's hard to kind of separate them, but what are we witnessing in these numbers? Yeah, I think what we're starting to see is that those two labor pools differentiating each other. There was always going to be a problem with that anyway. And what those two labor pools are is essentially, you know, there was millions upon millions of workers who were simply prevented from going to work by shutdowns, by quarantine, whatever, you, want, you know, whatever it was, restrictions from the government said you couldn't go to the office or you couldn't, you know, we had to close the local bar and therefore all the staff was laid off because the bar was closed. And then there's this other pool of workers who may have been in that category originally, but as reopening takes place, they find they have no work to go back to. So those in the first pool, those who are lucky enough to stay in the first pool, we would expect those people to all go back to work as the re reopening happens, as the shutdown restrictions are lifted. However, we don't know the size of the second pool because how would we? I mean, there's no statistics that differentiates these, these different parts of the labor market. And so what we're really interested in the second labor pool is you know, how much economic damage did we really take by shutting everything down such that these, this second labor pool continues to be a second labor pool, continues to be out of work for a prolonged period? And that's kind of the message we're getting from the pandemic, the federal claims, which suggests that the second labor pool is substantial and that it's not improving. And, and one of the things we're going to continue to talk about is something seems to have happened in July that may have actually worsened the situation. 